The first time I lived away from home, I was 18 years old and thought I was absolutely invincible. As you do when you first become an official adult, I could buy alcohol and cigarettes and, in general, I just thought I knew it all. I had moved in with my boyfriend at the time, now my ex, and after a few months of living together on just his wage, I got a job to help and make our lives more comfortable. The job was simple, working at a petrol station on the tills, stocking the shelves, etc. I generally enjoyed working there. I met a lot of friends and enjoyed a lot of banter with the regular customers. I loved everything about that job, except for the fact that it was five miles from home. I often didn't finish until 11pm and I had to walk as I didn't drive. My ex did, but his reluctance to pick me up is one of the many reasons that he is now my ex. This walk was usually done in the dark and most of the time I listened to music the entire time as I hated to walk in silence. Most of the time I didn't have any issues and the walk was entirely uneventful, actually enjoyable sometimes, until the one time that it wasn't. It's important to mention that at the same time that I started my job, I rescued a dog from a shelter, a massive Japanese Akita who was scared of everything but extremely protective of me. Anyway, one night in the middle of winter, I worked the last shift and finished at 11pm, saying goodbye to my colleagues before putting my headphones in and beginning my long walk home. It was below freezing and I stuffed my hands in my pockets, music drowning out all other noise as I trudged home. I had to cross a busy motorway on the way and it was here that I noticed someone else waiting to cross, a tall guy with a hat and gloves. I distinctly remember being relieved when he smiled at me in a friendly manner and I smiled back before a gap appeared in traffic and I crossed, two more miles to go. After a walk that seemed to last forever, my house finally came into view and I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing I could sink into a hot bath before getting into bed. The next day was my day off, so I very much was looking forward to lay in. As he usually was when I wasn't home, my dog was in the garden, and when he heard my footsteps, he came running to the gate to meet me. That's when the night took a turn. Rather than the tail-wagging, excitable, overgrown puppy that he usually was with me, my dog took one look in my direction through the gate and suddenly turned into something much more fitting of his wolf-like appearance. His teeth were bared his hackles up and his stance just screamed anger. On top of this, he was making a noise that I had never heard him make in all the time that I've had him, over two years by this point. I was confused, so I held my hand down to let him know it was just me, thinking that maybe he didn't recognize my outline or something. No such luck. If anything, he became more and more angry the closer I got. I'd never been scared of him before, so I didn't know what to do. Should I freeze or should I keep moving? As I soon discovered, freezing would have been a very bad idea. Careful to keep my hands out of reach of my dog's jaws, knowing that he had one heck of a bite on him from the accidental nips he had given me during our play fighting, I opened the gate and suddenly felt myself pulled into the garden by the bottom of my coat. As I looked back to see what on earth had gotten into my dog, I saw him running at full speed towards a guy, the guy from the motorway. I began to frantically scream for my dog to come back as he was running directly towards a busy road as my boyfriend at the time decided to come and see what was going on. This was one of the only times I saw him show any kind of protectiveness over me and my dog at all. Despite my screaming, my dog had caught up to the guy and leapt up, his jaws closing around the dude's arm. I heard the guy yell in agony before the street lights reflected off of something long and shiny in his other hand as it came down and disappeared into my dog. This guy had just stabbed my dog. As my dog let go of his arm, the dude took off in the opposite direction, and I ran to where my beloved dog lay in a heap on the floor. With tears streaming down my face, I yelled for my boyfriend to call the police about the guy who had followed me and cradled my dog's head in my lap. He looked at my hand as I used the others to try and stop the blood flowing from his neck, where the knife had been plunged into him but it was coming too fast that there was nothing I could do. As my boyfriend told the police as much as he could, my beloved best friend and now protector took his last breath in my lap. I was heartbroken and absolutely furious. The police did find the guy. They picked him up at the local accident and emergency where he had gone to get stitches for a dog bite. As it turned out, he lived almost directly next to the petrol station where I worked and he had followed me the entire way home. 
he admitted to stabbing my dog too. I don't know what happened to that guy as this event played a huge part in the end of my relationship and I moved back to my hometown, back to living with my parents where I knew I was safe. I will never know what that guy planned although I can hazard a guess as to what he wanted to do considering he followed me five miles with a knife in his pocket. I will forever be grateful for my dog. He probably saved my life that night by giving his own. Have you heard the stories of people who have gone into cardiac arrest on an operating table and experienced the phenomenon of floating above themselves as doctors and surgeons fight to save their lives? Yeah, me too. I always wondered how they could know the details of what happened to them during the entire time that they were technically dead. What was said and who performed which action in reviving them? For most of my life, I was massively skeptical about these stories, at least until it happened to me. I am now, unfortunately, among the small number of people who knows what my own corpse looks like and it haunts me. It happened during an emergency c-section, when my placenta ruptured and I began to lose massive amounts of blood. I remember being rushed down to theater, oxygen mask on my face and the kindest midwife ever holding my hand the entire way. With blood pouring from between my legs and my thankfully full-term baby in distress inside my womb. I have vivid memories of changing into a hospital gown while having a catheter put into me with no anesthetic before I was taken into theater and then, well, that's the last thing I remember until... Until, completely out of the blue, I found myself conscious of the fact that I was in a position that shouldn't be possible, almost as though I were glued to the ceiling. I know it sounds strange that this was the first thing I noticed, but in such a situation, all rational and logical thought gets completely cast aside in favor of what is happening to me kind of thinking. Then I looked down and gasped at what I saw, except no sound came out of my mouth. My eyes were glued to the form of myself on the operating table, eyes taped shut and a tube down my throat to help me breathe under anesthetic. As my gaze moved down over my body, I soon came across the single most horrifying sight that I had ever seen in my life or probably ever will see again. My intestines, a part of myself that I had never dreamed of seeing, were clearly showing as one of the nurses pushed them aside with a metal tool, allowing one of the surgeons to stitch what I assumed to be my womb. Although these two, the nurses holding my insides and the surgeon fixing the hole in my uterus, were calm and collected, I watched on as the other surgeon and another nurse shouted for them both to stand back. I hadn't noticed before, so focused on my internal organs, that they were hurriedly prepping the defibrillator. It was at this moment that I realized I was dead. As they stepped away from the table and the surgeon slammed the pads down on my chest, I felt an intense pulling inside my there but not there floating self, tugging me down in the direction of my body. With each attempt made to shock my heart back into its normal rhythm, I moved closer and closer to my own body. The nurse who had helped set up the defib hooked up a bag of blood, obviously needed to replenish that which I had lost before I felt myself fall, and then I woke up. I don't know how long later in the recovery room and found a nurse smiling down at me with a clipboard in her hand. She seemed quite kind and gently told me what happened during surgery how I had basically been dead for four and a half minutes, though she obviously didn't word it quite so bluntly. All I could do was nod, not wanting to voice what I had experienced, before I asked for my baby and tried to forget the sight of my own insides, but it just wasn't likely to happen. For months, now years, I had suffered from severe postnatal depression and, unsurprisingly, post-traumatic stress disorder. I spoke to the surgeon when he came to check on me after about a week in the hospital, told him what I had seen, but, but he told me that my brain had created the scenario to cope with the trauma that had happened to my body. I asked him how I could have known how many shocks it took, seven by the way, for my heart to start beating again and he just assumed it to be a lucky guess. I'm still not entirely sure whether I actually experienced this or whether, like the surgeon suggested, it is a figment of my traumatized mind. I know what I saw, and I am certain that I know things I shouldn't, 
so I lean more towards having actually experienced it. Although the depression has lessened in severity, I still have nightmares almost every night about the sight of my own lifeless body, and I wake up with a deep need to feel my own pulse. I can't watch documentaries or dramas about hospitals just in case I hear the long, monotonous beep of a flatlining ECG machine and am taken back to that moment. I know that this might be confusing to some, but it is incredibly difficult to try and explain what happened to me. I just thought that writing it and sharing the experience might help me in some way, but only time will tell. This happened on December 21st, 2016. I'm a 21 year old Canadian girl, 19 at the time. At this time in my life I was pretty desperate for attention so I went on a lot of bad dates and put myself in a lot of bad situations. So when this pretty cute guy started hitting on me and I was pretty flattered and I agreed to go do some mushrooms at his place and get to know each other better. I'm not going to go into details but let's just say that that was a really bad idea. So I ended up leaving his place around midnight, out of my mind, with a long and cold walk to the train station ahead of me. It really didn't bother me though, to be honest. I was just happy to be out of that situation and on my way home. I also really enjoy the cold and had done mushrooms many times by this point and was really enjoying the walk. It was just a straight walk of mostly residential streets until you came to a busier street that leads to downtown. It separates the residential streets from the mall that I worked at at the time and the Wendy's that was closer to the lights where I had to cross. Just beyond the mall is the train station. You have to walk either through the mall parking lot or through a field where the old high school used to be to get to the train station. So I got to the lights and was waiting to cross. However, it was quite late and the light was taking what felt like forever for it to change. That's when a big blue pickup truck came driving down the road away from downtown. It slowed right down as it passed me before speeding off. I probably should have sensed some danger, but my mind was worried that he slowed down to let me pass, and when I didn't, he left, making me think that the light wasn't going to change. I now noticed that same blue truck around the block and was now sitting in the parking lot of the closed Wendy's. Now I realized that something was wrong. The light finally changed and I walked across the street. I planned on just walking past it and going through the mall parking lot to get to the train. I kept my head down as I walked. The man in the truck yelled something at me as I walked past. I looked up and in my state of mind I thought it was a regular customer of mine as I worked at that mall. I raised my arms up in the air like, uh, you got me. But as I approached the truck I realized how wrong I was. This was a completely different person and I was now at the side of his truck in an abandoned Wendy's parking lot. I just stared at him. I could feel someone staring at me from the back seat of the truck, right behind the driver's seat, but there was no one in the front passenger seat. The driver smiled and asked me things straight out of a PSA. Things like, what part of the city do you live in, and do you live alone? I was being polite and actually answering his questions truthfully because, for some reason, I thought he was a cop. I mean, that had to be why his questions were so forward, right? He obviously knew I was out of it and was trying to make sure I got home safe, right? Wrong. In a matter of maybe five minutes, he knew a part of the city I lived in, that I lived with my dad, and that I had planned on taking the train home. It wasn't until he straight up asked for directions to my house that I played dumb and said that I didn't know. He kind of raised his eyebrow at me and said, So you don't know where you live? I kind of laughed and was like, nope, I guess not, and I walked around the back of his truck, headed for the field to get to the train station, and he pulled away. I had to cross a small street to get to the field. I noticed further down the street was the truck parking facing me, and I looked at it. It inched forward a little to make it seem like he was leaving. I turned around and kept walking. I turned around a few seconds later to see the truck still there. I put my arms in the air and yelled, I see you. He then drove off as he was going to circle around the mall. I ran into the field and I pulled out my phone. I dialed 911 and paused before pressing call. I was clearly on something and there was a good chance that I wouldn't be taken seriously. I was also worried that I was going to have to take the cops back to that guy's house 
as it had been where I left from and where I got the stuff from, so instead I called my dad. By the time he picked up the phone I was crying. I explained to him what was happening and he said to get somewhere safe and call a cab. If I had been smart, I would have taken the train a couple of stops in the wrong direction and then called the cab. I didn't. Instead, I went to the train station that he knew I was going to be at and called the cab. I waited there for 20 minutes. I kept peeking out to see if he was there, but I didn't see him. My cab arrived and I got in and told the cab where to go. I was looking behind us the whole time. Just before we made it to downtown, I noticed that a large truck was behind us, but I couldn't see the color until we turned and the truck turned behind us. It was, of course, blue. I started freaking out and I begged for the cab to pull over. He did so reluctantly and the blue truck slowly rolled by and then turned the corner like he was going to drive back around the block. I yelled at the driver to start going again and he did so, very annoyed. I finally did make it home and collapsed on my bed in tears. I didn't leave the house for two days terrified that he was driving around my neighborhood looking for me. I did see him and his truck one more time but it's not really worth mentioning. Please be safe people. There were so many things I could have done to prevent this from happening but I was too out of it and dumb to think straight. For a bit of background, I got a cell phone at 10. Awesome, I thought. I can text my friends and play games with my phone. Now, one thing I loved to do was do prank calls. Silly boy stuff. Now, I would have gotten company numbers and call and say the classics. Is your refrigerator running? Did the doctor call? Can I borrow your cat? Now, I had a good laugh and didn't mean any harm. Now, one day, my cousin that I never really see came over for a sleepover. She was a girl, I was a boy, we had different interests, so I gave her an idea to prank call a number and she kept saying no. I finally asked why. Her answer still to this day sends shivers down my spine. A few years back, like three to four years before this sleepover that happened a long time ago, coincidentally my cousin was having another sleepover with her friends. They were prank calling numbers, when it was my cousin's turn she dialed the ten digits of what I like to call horror. She presses the call button. One ring, nothing. Two rings, three rings, four rings. As she was about to hang up, someone picks up. Silence. She breaks the silence with one of her jokes. She laughs and hangs up. They all have a good laugh, and then they call. They pick up, and they hang up. After exactly 60 seconds, he calls again, and again exactly every minute. And then the breathing started and then the sinister laughing, I imagined him grinning. This was all going on for about an entire solid hour. The creepiest part is that my cousin had blocked that number. So this happened back almost seven years ago. Around this time, my grandmother got extremely ill and we were preparing for tragic news. For context, I don't live in the safest city in California, let alone the safest neighborhood. We lived in a small but comfortable house for almost 12 years. Although my neighborhood wasn't very trustworthy, I lived two blocks away from one of my best friends, which I will call her L. She would always come visit and we would talk about upcoming video games and laugh at memes until my parents arrived home. This particular rainy afternoon, we had received a phone call that my grandmother is at her final hours. My dad, who my grandmother was his mother, wanted to find a travel agent to purchase an airplane ticket to leave the next following morning as she lived in Mexico. As I tried my best to comfort my dad, he prepared to head out because the agency closed within an hour. He owned a small blue pickup truck and left our chain-linked fence open because of the weather conditions. I watched him drive out and into the road and noticed two hooded young men walking on the sidewalk. One was wearing a red sweater while the other was wearing a black jacket. I didn't think much of it because it was raining profusely and I'm sure that they were just protecting themselves from the rain. I sat in the living room with my sweet dog, Pelusa as we both heard someone coming in from our backyard fence door. I checked out the window and the door was completely wide open. 
Figured because of the weather, it opened by its own, so I continued to watch TV while cuddling my cute dog. Soon after, I began to feel this sense of dread that something was not right after all. Now, I'm a really sensitive individual when it comes to stress, so I immediately needed to use the bathroom, which was located near our backyard door. I entered into the bathroom and began to throw up. As I was emptying my stomach, I heard someone knocking at our front door and thought maybe my mom was coming home from work and forgot her keys. I tried my best to immediately clean myself up and once again heard the someone knocking, but it sounded as if though that they were trying to break the door down. I looked through the front window and noticed it was the hooded man with the red sweater. I was only 16 at that time and had no experience with self-defense, so my first instinct was to try to find something that I could use as a weapon. I went to the kitchen and I grabbed the sharpest knife that I could find. As seconds began to feel like hours, I panicked and locked myself in the bathroom, and through the window I saw the other hooded man in my backyard trying to break in through the garage entry door. My poor ankle biter pup was yelping her life away while I was trying to dial 911. The operator told me to stay on the line as police were only about five minutes away. Soon after, I began to hear police sirens heading to the direction of my house and heard the two men fled from the garage door. I nearly threw up again out of shock when one of the police officers knocked on the bathroom door. I gave my report and called my friend L to keep me company as I was still trying to wrap my head around what had just occurred. There was nothing stolen, but they did damage both of our entry doors and we replaced them immediately after. A few months passed by when none of us were home, our home was broken into once again. They took everything in sight and, needless to say, we had enough and found a new and safer home. Every time I hang out with Elle, I think about that traumatic day, and I can't thank her enough for being there for me. I also want to thank my lucky stars because if it wasn't for the fact that my neighborhood had a history, the police wouldn't have made it in time. Number 1. The Pianist When I was around 11, I joined the choir group at our local church. I was so excited yet shy to make friends, but fortunately the other kids were nice enough to make me feel welcomed. One night as we finished singing, the pianist approached me. He was mid-forties and had a big gut. He had that leering smile as well that always made me feel uneasy, but I always just brushed it off. He told me, Hey, put your name and number in our sign-up sheet for the summer program. I can't exactly remember what type of summer program it was, but of course, I obliged right away, excited to spend more time with the people I'm getting to know a bit better as time went on. A few days later, I received a text seemingly from him. It was totally innocent at first, just to ask if I could make it to practice or the service and whatnot, until one day, he started to get weird and ask questions like, do you like going to the mall? I didn't want to be rude. I know, looking back, I realized how that line always seems to get younger girls into trouble, huh? So I said, of course I do. He then went on how he would love to bring me to the mall closest to us and would love to take me shopping. Again, I was 11, so what does a mid-40-year-old man want from a kid? My mother soon found out about the text because I showed her. I didn't really think much of it. I even laughed when I showed her and said, look mom, this guy is weird. I thought it was just that. He was just weird. Boy, was I wrong. She was furious and demanded to have the pianist fired. It was a big mess. A few days later, I found out that this man would bring young girls to the mall, buy them whatever they wished to gain their trust, and bring them to a dark movie house, and of course, you guessed it. I was shocked when I found out about this. Definitely dodged a bullet. Apparently, he had been doing that for years, and finally got caught. Number two, the priest. I know, I know, Catholic priests don't have stellar reputations and it's true. Some are pure and some should definitely be behind bars. The same local church I was in a few months after the incident, one of the priests seemed to be too touchy to all of us, even young boys. He'd been one of the senior priests there. Sometimes he would just innocently pat us on our heads, but most time, he would caress our lower backs or our arms for a few seconds while talking to us, 
it definitely made me super uneasy. I think it did to all of us. No one ever said anything, at least to my knowledge. Then one day he started messaging me on Facebook saying things like, Wow, you are so beautiful. Every angle is great. And stuff like that. Seeing you in church brightens my mood every time you are so beautiful. Mind you, I was still 11 years old and I'm pretty sure with all his white hair and thin frail frame he was nearly in his 60s. The touches advanced to him putting his hand on my thigh. On our thighs, I wasn't the only one. I told my mom again about this and she suggested I stop attending church altogether since creepy men seemed to surround the place. I did and I don't know what became of that. I do wish young girls and boys are safe from him though. Number 3. The Trainer I had a time in my life where I was overweight and it definitely made me insecure. So my mom, being ever supportive, enrolled me to a gym. I was a teenager around this point and thought it was going well until one day, a trainer I didn't know approached me and asked for my number. He said it was so he can inform me about the classes or events the gym offers because they do it to all their members. Stupid teenager me of course obliged and gave him my number. Again, like the pianist, it was innocent at first, just asking if I'm enjoying the gym and all that. He then suddenly asked if I'm dating. I responded, no, I'm too young. He then asked, are you interested in dating older men? I didn't know what to think of that, but still I answered, uh, I guess, I don't know. He said, I'm 32, would you date me? Well, needless to say, I quit the gym and blocked his number. Number 4. The Guitarist Another supposed mentor of mine who took advantage. We signed up for musical lessons for extracurricular and I chose the guitar. The room for the lessons were small, just enough for a few equipments and two persons. To save space, I suppose. The place had a few rooms to cater to other students. I was still a teenager here, too. At first he was a nice dude, probably mid-thirties. Then the touching started to happen. It was only session two when he started caressing my shoulders, seemingly encouraging me that I can do it. Just keep practicing, he said. Nervously, I said okay. I was nervous because, I kid you not, he looked really creepy. He had long, thin hair that was tied back, had a big gut as well, and some facial hair that was unkempt. I don't want to sound judgmental, but that was what I was thinking when I was a teenager. Next session, he suddenly put his hand on my thigh. At first, while explaining our lessons that day, he just kept it there, like it was a normal thing to do. Then before we started, he started to move it up and down. Well, guess who never showed up to the next session? I was too scared to go for the third session and to even tell my mom. I just said I was feeling sick. I forget how events transpired from there, but all I know is I never went back. Number 5. The Chef and the Old Guest by this point, I'm already 18. I did an internship abroad and got close to the chefs at the place I trained at. There was one particular chef, though. He was really nice at first, aren't they all? My shifts start really early, like 4 a.m. early. Backstory, I open the place by myself until a chef arrives to help start setting up, then a few other colleagues come. It was around 5 a.m. It was just the two of us then. I was busy prepping. He greeted me like normal, then suddenly he came up behind me and started massaging my shoulders. At first I laughed and nudged him a good morning. I thought he would stop there, but he literally pushed himself up to my behind and breathed out onto my ear. Hmm, you were good. His English was broken and he was Chinese. I was so scared and just walked away after pushing him away. I pretended that I forgot to do something elsewhere. I tried avoiding him since then, and I know I should have told my superiors, but there was also an incident where I had an old guest who suddenly grabbed my shoulders and kissed my right cheek while taking a video of himself showing off the view of the restaurant. I felt helpless then, and when the chef incident happened, I thought no one would do anything like before anyway, so why bother? My last encounter with the chef was during my last day. He caught me alone in the elevator moved up close to me, grabbed my shoulders, and took a selfie on his phone. My smile was obviously awkward and forced. I was too shocked to say anything. 
He went out first, and after a few seconds, I got my bearings and went back to my apartment. Number six, young adult. I'm used to catcalls and men who stare, or even who obviously fake accidentally brushing against me just to touch me, or random guys who message me. Facebook and Instagram can be a dangerous place too. One guy found out where I worked and dropped by and even left food for me. I only replied a few times to him just to be polite, so leaving food and dropping by was definitely not normal. I've never even met him, just had common friends. I blocked him and never heard from him again, thank god. Next, there was also this guy who apparently saves all my pictures on his phone and has an album for me. He sent me a screen capture and would always message me about how beautiful I am. I deleted my Facebook and have my Instagram on private now. Ending with this, I hope young girls or even young boys have people around them to protect them against these types of people. The world is dangerous. Be safe, kids. It was May of 2015. It was around my birthday. I was having a few friends over to spend the night at my house to watch scary movies and go to bed at ungodly hours. Still guilty of all of this. There was a park behind my house, so when it was around dark at around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided to hang out there a little before starting our movie night. The park was empty, so we were laughing, talking, and messing around as usual when we noticed a figure wearing a hoodie watching us from the fence. It gave us an uneasy feeling, but we thought nothing of it at first. After a good 20 minutes of still walking, we noticed he didn't move, still watching us from the fence. At this moment, we started to get creeped out. So I, thinking creepy stalkers were just happening in movies I like to watch, not here in my little Canadian town, decided to go ask him what he wanted. As I get closer, I get a creepy feeling. May I help you? I said. He said nothing, but did a step behind. I walked a little closer to him, he stepped back again. At first finding the situation funny and entertaining, I was now annoyed and scared. Why are you watching us since we got here? He started walking away, so I ran after him. I know, not very smart. As he started running, he got a whistle out of his pocket and started to blow in his whistle. As he did that, Two cars came out of nowhere at full speed a few streets away. I started to run, screaming to my friends to run also. The park is behind my house, but we had to go around the block to get there since there was fences separating us from the park, but we could not go back at my house without passing by the cars now slowly looking for us, but there was a hole in the fence. Two of my friends went through the hole, but me and my other friends were scared we would not pass through, so we hid behind a tiny tree, which was just fine since it was dark outside. Seeing the cars by the park got us freaking out, so we decided to give it a shot and go through the small hole. I made my friend go first. I went after, and we ran to my house. We didn't call the police, and I don't know why. Something was really up that night. I couldn't say for sure what this was all about, but it definitely wasn't good. When this happened to me I was a young woman in my early 20s but I still don't look my own age. I don't have my driver's license and never had it so I would walk to get to and from the daycare center my two kids frequented. That day was a beautiful fall day and I almost arrived at the daycare. I was about to cross a little street but there was a dark SUV that was going to cross so I stopped. The car stopped and the driver opened his window. He wasn't sketchy or anything, he looked like a random... 30 to 40 something man. He starts asking me about directions to a restaurant in town that he could eat at. I tried to answer as best as I could, expecting that he would eventually leave, but he didn't. He continued by inviting me to go eat with him. I answered no thanks. He insisted by saying I wouldn't have to pay anything and that he wasn't a bandit. The second he said that was a huge red flag and it went up in my mind. I told him I had to go get my son now and started walking towards the daycare. I went inside, thinking that interaction was weird, but decided not to make a big deal of it. I got my son and we started to walk back home. We only had walked a minute or two when I saw the weirdo's car drive by. He gave me a nod and continued on. 
We continued our walk another few minutes after we had to cross a street. He stopped in front of us and asked me if I wanted to lift home. I refused and continued to walk. At this point, I was on high alert. Normally, I would let my son push the stroller just a little ahead of me, following him closely but not touching the stroller. He was always a pain in the butt to walk, my son to and from daycare, this was one of the tricks that made him kind of follow normally. So after the weirdo asked me if I wanted to lift, I went ahead and placed my hands on the stroller handles, placing my son between me and the stroller. At about halfway home, the car passed beside us again, and then he told me that he had to speak with me and if we could stop by the park nearby. I answered no again, and he drives off. Now, I was on high alert and changed my habitual route, just in case he would follow me. This was before cell phones, so I couldn't call anyone. I made it home safely, but I checked over my shoulder for the rest of the trip home. Spotting houses where there would be a sign of someone being home so I could go bang on the door if he came back, and making plans in my mind how I could flee if I saw him again. At the time the story takes place, I was 14, almost 15 and a sophomore in high school. I've never had a paranormal encounter in my life, but I still somewhat believed in the paranormal. This is the first close encounter I had ever had in my life. In case you don't know what a skinwalker is, they're people that can morph into an animal of their choice and originate from Navajo legend. I'll go further into depth about why I think this encounter was a skinwalker later in the story. So I was at my cousin's house with both my stepbrothers, and all of us were really into Nerf guns at the time. I'll refer to my cousin as T. My oldest stepbrother is J, and my younger is A. For our entertainment, we decided to split up into two teams and have what we called a Nerf War, very creatively. The goal of the game was to knock down both of our opponents by hitting them once with a Nerf bullet, as it was pretty difficult to accomplish. Once one person had been shot, they were out of the game and not able to be revived, and once both of them had been shot, the game had been won by the other team. Simple enough. The boundaries were a couple of blocks long, which included a nearby park that we liked to stay at and hide from the other team. Because it was getting dark and we had to leave my cousin's house soon, we decided to have another quick round. We watched as T and A ran in the direction of a nearby ditch, so J and I decided to run towards the park, which was behind us. We ran for a couple of minutes until we reached the huge fake rock that had a slide on top, and we decided to camp up there. For a few minutes we sat there waiting to see them try to sneak up on us because they knew that they were at the park. J and I noticed that there was a dog next to the jungle gym, walking around aimlessly and we thought that maybe it was T's Chihuahua. However, we heard somebody call its name and realized that there was a guy standing in the nearby garden. Naturally, we didn't think much of him except how it was creepy that he was just standing there. I tried to rationalize and told Jay that he was probably watering the plants, despite the fact that he obviously wasn't. Before we could realize, the man was gone. But again, we thought nothing of it. Out in the field next to the park, I spotted two figures lying down next to a hill, T and A. Jay and I split up. I hid behind a row of bongos and he hid behind a nearby rock. After a few moments of silence between us, I told him that we should move into the nearby brush and stalk them from afar, but he refused. Out of nowhere, we heard a loud screech coming from the nearby brush. We thought it was some type of bird, specifically an eagle, but I also suspected it could be a coyote. A few moments later, I was looking up and admiring the sky when I noticed a shooting star, which I initially thought was a plane. I'm not sure whether it has any significance to the story, but you'll find out why I think it might later. From that point on, we both had very strange feelings that we were being watched by someone or something. I had very weird tingling sensations that started at my feet and went up to my chest multiple times, and Jay said that he had a burning chest pain that lasted for a long while, to the point where he could barely run. After we left our spot and were going to take a back route to T's house, we heard the screech again, but it sounded like it came from where we were hiding. Ultimately, we won the match, but our parents were looking for us and we had to leave his house. 
T decided to spend the night at our house, and as we were waiting for him in the car, A asked if we too had heard the screech. We started to discuss what we thought it was, and we all agreed that it was some kind of eagle. However, after discussing with T, he told us what he encountered. When they were in the field stalking us, T had heard the screech right in his ear, which is nowhere near where we heard it. After that, he said it felt like someone was behind him. He turned to see what was bothering him. Right as he did, he said he was drawn to the same shooting star we saw. After we left the park, which they weren't aware of, they said they both heard Jay's voice calling desperately out for A, his brother. Thinking he might have been hurt, T decided that he should go help, but something just felt off. They ultimately decided to go back to the house. Looking back, we learned why if they didn't make that decision, they would have been as good as dead. T said that he had the exact same feeling as we did while making his way back to the house. Because I was a big fan of horror stories and heard much about skinwalkers, I asked them if they thought it could possibly be a skinwalker, but nobody really thought so. I decided to do some research and we all realized that a skinwalker fits the situation perfectly. First of all, an eagle is one of the most common forms that skinwalkers take, which would explain how we all thought the screech came from an eagle. Secondly, both teams heard the screech at different locations, and skinwalkers are known to move extremely quick. Third, they can morph into familiar faces and also imitate voices, which would explain how they heard Jay's voice calling out after we left the park. Lastly, they can actually dig through your mind and know what your fears are, and T was always afraid of people getting hurt while we were playing. That night, we were all extremely scared because all the videos and stories we watched about skinwalkers. However, the final piece of the puzzle was when I woke up to A standing in our doorway crying. Our dog had died the night before in her sleep. According to one of the many sources I found, I read that some skinwalkers are able to poison the loved ones of their victims after an encounter. What do you guys think? Do you think what I encountered was a skinwalker? Or was it just a huge coincidence? So about two or so months ago, I was out and about with my mom, and while driving home, I asked if we could stop by a graveyard we passed when driving down one of our usual routes. It probably sounds weird, but to be real, I really just like taking pictures. Aesthetically pleasing pictures to be more exact. And as you probably know, if you find the right headstone and capture it from just the right angle, you can get a really cool shot. I wanted to just get a few pictures just for kicks and I'd be on my way. My mom liked to take pictures too, so she came along with me to find cool things to photograph. Now, I didn't actually get anything paranormal in the pictures, but the story is strange all the same. This graveyard is a bit small. It's got a gate surrounding it, and it's in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. Strange placement, I know. I always wondered what the surrounding residents have seen. The graveyard has a paved road that makes a U-shape and circles back around to the front. We drove down the very, very short path and started from the back taking the pictures. This graveyard is pretty old, so of course I got caught up in capturing the essence of the time-faded gravestones. Some stood up, some lay in the ground. My personal favorite is the one that used to have a carving of a lamb on the top, but now is so old you can barely make out the shape. There's also a few graves that simply say infant or baby on them, and some graves that even date back to World War I. It was such an interesting experience, the whole thing, melancholy and all. As I approached the front area of the graveyard, I broke off from where my mom was to go look elsewhere. I found a couple of graves that sat in the ground, unkempt and dirty. Then I saw one grave in particular almost completely buried under a layer of dust, dirt, and cut grass. That's when the most intense feeling washed over me. It's hard to describe, but I felt scared in some way, almost like someone yelled at me for something I did, and maybe that's what happened. Either way, the feeling I got was not welcoming at all. Whatever was there wanted me gone, and it wanted me gone there and then. I lingered for a second, feeling confused, but then made a fast-paced walk back to my mom. I was on the verge of tears for literally no reason, and I said to her, We need to leave. She of course asked why, and I didn't really give a coherent response until I calmed down. 
I felt like something didn't want me there. It wasn't like a random thought that I had, I mean I physically felt fear. My chest tightened up like it does when you get really scared, like you were having a panic attack and trust me, I know exactly how that feels. I've had many panic attacks in my 14 years of living and it sucks. I felt a little dizzy from whatever happened to be honest, and I didn't feel scared or anything, it just felt like someone yelled at me for doing something wrong. At least that's how I feel when I get yelled at for anyone who isn't as sensitive to anger as I am, it can feel a bit like you're being threatened with a knife. This story is probably kind of underwhelming to read, but I have to say I was scared out of my mind for several hours. I guess whoever was buried there wanted them pesky kids off their lawn. No hard feelings, I get mad whenever someone wakes me up too. Also a bonus, since I always look at the graveyard when driving by it, the other day I saw something weird, and I've never seen anything paranormal there before. They have some standard garden hoses around the garden for keeping the grass green, and a few columbariums on the side. When I was driving past there, I saw what looked like a transparent pair of legs walking. Once we passed the garden hose and columbariums, it was gone, and that was in about a second. I didn't think it was just a person that was being partially obscured by the angle of the sun or something, but no matter how hard I looked and that time we were in sight of the graveyard, I didn't see anyone there. I didn't even see an animal. It's pretty standard ghost stuff, but still, it was creepy and... I thought I'd share. I've been working in a retail store for about a year and a half now. I'm 18. As my supervisor and I say, a grown boy. I started there when I was 16. I don't want to give any names, so I'll just call the guy Todd. Todd is a middle-aged man who is mentally slow. He lives with his parents still and he, I hate to be mean, acts like a child. Todd doesn't make me fear for my life or anything. This isn't going to be some story where Todd turned out to be Michael Myers and tried to cut my head off. When I first started working there I honestly thought he was just drunk and it shocked the crap out of me that we let this guy come to work drunk, sit in the break room and every once in a while stumble out and gather carts. He's the longest employee at that location. He's been there since the store opened. When I first started working, he would talk to nobody but my supervisors and not unless he had to unless it was, we'll call him Toby. Toby is a pretty nice guy and basically everyone's favorite supervisor, including other supervisors. I think Todd started babbling to Toby about the Simpsons or something and then put his hand on Toby's shoulder and gave his classic, Welp, I'm going to break. I learned that after about six months, Todd will start to talk to you. We just don't have cashiers that stick around that long. Plus, Toby and I talked a lot and Todd started to join in. Usually, Toby and I just make jokes about customers and other employees and Todd would think they're funny, just not the same thing. Another peculiar thing about Todd is that he's diabetic and really loves the candy in the break room and when you see him with it, he goes, don't tell mom. Associates and customers use the same bathroom. I usually take a pee right after I clock in. Why pee for free? I swear to God I see Todd in the bathroom more than anyone else. Which one thing you learn is for as handsy as Todd is, he doesn't wash his hands. Ever. Anyways, it's a full house. Three urinals furthest from the door is a customer, then Todd, then me using the lower urinal. I follow the proper procedure of taking a pee in a public bathroom and staring at the wall in front of me. Well, Todd gives me a tap on the shoulder while he's peeing and I give him an annoyed what look. He gestures to the customers next to him and pretends to be drinking a glass as if to signal the guy is drunk. The customer is not drunk, he's just trying to take a pee. I give him a stop at look and try to finish and get out of there ASAP, figuring he's not going to try and joke around about this customer if I'm not there. One time I go to the training room, which is just a room with a conference table and a bunch of monitors on the wall to do online training. I'm in the training room doing my monthly online training with the lights off just because I like it that way. Todd comes hobbling in for his 15th break before lunch and he leaves the lights off too. That isn't creepy, tons of people do it. You suck if you turn them on. Todd gives me his regular slap pad on the back thing and plops next to me with a huge sigh. 
I ignore him because I just want to get done with my stupid training. Then it dawns on me he doesn't have training. Why in the world is he always on the computers in here? So I look over and he's typing in Amazon.com. Just like that. And I'm thinking, not really supposed to do that, Todd, but I don't really care. Then I notice what he types into the search bar on Amazon. Playboy. No, I'm shocked and I'm staring at his monitor. This is odd for him, even. First, he never struck me as a guy who looks at dirty magazines. Second, I thought he even would know that he shouldn't be looking at that stuff at work. He scrolls through a little bit and then notices I'm staring. I'm too shocked to hide it. His response. Oh, uh, it's, it's not about the naked girls. No, I'm not interested in that. It's just Hugh Hefner. I really admire the man, you know what I mean? All I can think to say is, uh-huh. I finish my training and go back into the floor. Find out later that apparently he told a female supervisor of mine that his father bought him a subscription to Playboy for Christmas. Well, Todd, Hugh Hefner is dead, so getting new magazines may be a little more than admiration for the guy. The oddest encounter I had with Todd in the bathroom was while I was taking a leak. He comes in, luckily no customers in there this time, and starts making weird moaning noises. They weren't sexual, but they were some kind of odd moaning noises that he was doing quietly as he approached the urinal next to me. It was a long day and I just wasn't going to entertain this right now, so I continue my business and he sees that I'm ignoring him, so he takes a peek over the patrician and looks at my junk. I sternly say to him, look away. He looks up right away and tries to say he wasn't looking and then does it again with his eyes closed and more sternly and with a greater tint of anger in my voice I say, look away. I finish and leave. Later, as he's clocking out, I explain to him he can't be doing that in the bathroom. He tries to explain he was just messing around but I can't get him to understand that's exactly the problem. You can't be messing around in the bathroom. You do your business and you leave, Todd. Some of the more concerning parts about Todd is when he gets upset. Having worked there for two years, I often get left in charge when a supervisor goes to lunch or isn't scheduled. Our schedule system sucks. And being in charge kind of sucks because I don't get a raise and I don't have the authority to tell people what to do, but I'm still expected to do it. One time, Todd comes back from break and I ask him to take one of the kid carts back and he does. And he's about to go to break again, literally after doing one basic task so I inform him that he needs to take some of the regular carts back to the other end. It was really piling up. When he lets me know he's going to take another break, he storms off and clangs the carts around as he takes them back. He comes back and commands that he's going to break. I wasn't going to fight it. It's no secret that Todd doesn't do his job well. So often we send a cashier out to help him. This particular day I'm in charge while my supervisor is on lunch. We sent, we'll call him Jim, to help him. Well, Todd comes on in to go to break while Jim is out there. We sent Jim out during Todd's last break to catch up, and he's been out there since. The conversation goes like this. I'm gonna go on break. Are the carts done? Yeah. Where's Jim? Oh, he's still out there. Well, I need him in here. We sent him out to help you. I need you to be working until it's clear enough for him to come in. I'm short-staffed, and I can't be having the cashiers out there. He's not your cashier, he's Toby's. Fine. I... We need Toby's cashier in here. That's not my fault. And here's where I messed up. It is your fault. That is literally the dumbest thing I could have said in that argument. The dumbest. Right after I say that, I try to change it by saying, I mean... I don't know what I mean, though it just slipped, but it's too late. Message received. And with my luck right now, I have a three people on self-checkout that I need to be watching, and I got another cashier needing me to solve a problem for the customer he's checking out. And at this time, Todd isn't yelling better, he's talking loudly and angrily. It's not my fault! He's just repeating that over and over again, and all I can say to try and quiet him as every head on the front turns to watch is, I know Todd, I'm sorry. But he keeps going, and I only have one register open, and this customer's question is holding up the line, so I need to answer it. So, I ignore Todd as he continues to throw a tantrum and help the customer then try to comprehend how this escalated so quickly in the last 30 seconds. And thank God, Jim is walking in just then, and all I can say is, 
It's fine, Todd. Just go to go to break. The most concerning encounter I've had with Todd was just on the sales floor during a conversation between Toby, Todd, and I. To give background, our encounters can still be just plain weird from an outside view. Todd often pretends to stab me or shoot me with an arrow or throw a grenade at me. It's odd, especially the stabbing. Another time, he became obsessive over an inside joke he didn't understand. A co-worker he calls that short girl, as Todd refers to her once, tried to explain who I was to someone and describe me as the chubby one. I didn't take offense or anything. I got jacked up in an accident really bad and fell off my workout schedule. It was absolutely hysterical, not only the fact that the person she had to describe me to should have known who I was, but that she just flat out called me the chubby one. She started calling me chubby one all the time after that, and customers would get all confused. Well, Todd overheard, and he thought it was funny, so whenever I see him, he always calls me chubs, or some variation. He even once spelled it out to me with the numbers that corresponded to the letter in the alphabet. The joke at the store is, the chubby one as in the number, and it's for the most part the one girl saying it. It was way over his head. Another time at 6am I said good morning to him and he told me to screw off. I told Toby right after that he'd apologize at the end of the meeting and wouldn't you know it, he did. Another time Toby and I were talking about our ages, it's called a slow night and Todd jumps in so I ask him how old he is and he goes, yeah I'm 34, I still live with my parents, does that bother you? But the most concerning thing Todd has ever said to me is when Toby and I were talking on a slow night. What he says doesn't make me fear for my life personally, but it does make me fear for him and the people around him. Somehow Toby and I start talking about our favorite colors. I know, very exciting. Anyways, Todd joins the conversation so we ask him what's his favorite color. And I'm almost positive this is a direct quote. My favorite color is the color of blood. Sometimes when I'm upset, I think of animals hurting. Their blood calms me. And then he stammers off to his break. Todd and I stare at him for a second as he wanders away. Toby eventually breaks the awkward silence with, I don't care how slow you are, that's just weird. That statement has bothered me for almost a year now. It just concerns me deeply. I'm working on this as part of a video I'm doing for October on why I don't do seances anymore. I was about 7 or 8, thus my oldest sister was about 16 and so as a birthday gift she got to redo her room with paint and flooring of her liking. She'd gone with alternating 12 inch black and white vinyl floor tiles that made a large checkerboard pattern and pale lavender walls. The paint had dried for a full day with the windows open the next day we put up the trim back up so it was the last night that the room would be empty and the furniture would be moved back in tomorrow. So my oldest sister decided this would be a perfect time to hold a seance in the room as there would be nothing but us three girls and a candle, nothing to interfere or cause false positives. And by their reasoning they absolutely needed a third person. So I was drafted and they made me swear I would be serious and not laugh or anything. I agreed because... They were my big sisters and I wanted to do whatever they were doing. We set up and they get started. I'm just being quiet as we are holding hands in a circle around the single tall wide white candle. A few minutes in the flame starts to flutter a little bit and they start asking about who is here and we're all pretty intent on the flame. But then something catches the oldest attention and I see her giving my middle sister's arm jerky tugs to get her attention and they both are looking behind me. I freeze up because it's a debate of should I look before I get eaten by whatever is behind me or should I just go quietly into that good night? Internal struggle. My oldest mouth has dropped open so I start to turn while breaking connection with my sister's hands and look. It's just my shadow but it's not my shadow because my shadow doesn't put its arms down as it had done nor does it turn with me. It has its arms straight out like a crucifix style and it's way too thin to be me. I could see the bumps of the emaciated ribs and the shoulders and elbow joints were big compared to the arms. It obviously isn't wearing a loose hand-me-down t-shirt 
and it's still not moving and it's way too high up on the wall for the light source angle. My sisters are screaming and running out of the room at this point, and when they break the doorway, my shadow snaps back to my shadow and is low on the wall in the shape of a little girl turned around with arms down. I see it switch back to what it should be. That's what finally snaps me out of my shock, and I then start screaming and scramble to run out too, but I lacked traction in my socks and it was more of a shuffle on all fours. Everyone refused to go back in there and Dad had to go blow out the candle. I do remember from that point lit candles were never allowed in the house again, unless they were on a birthday cake. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel, like today. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com, and you can wear it around for Halloween, and give out candy, or you can wear it as a costume and get candy, and, you know get diabetes. Don't do that. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.